Um, I'm a member of the Lane Center Advisory Board, and it's been a pleasure to serve. Uh, and this is just one more example of the work that the, uh, the, the Bill Lane Center for, Center for the American West is doing, reaching out into communities that um, we're, we're really taking a, a, a collection of information and sharing information. Uh, it's also a pleasure to acknowledge the Bill Lane Center and David and Bruce's participation here. They, um, they lead the way very well and our, our advisory board, many of them would be here. Unfortunately, this year it turned out to be a low attendance. But uh, in addition to the leadership of Bruce and David, I think it's very important to acknowledge the, the stalwart staff that uh, has made this possible, and that's Preeti Haymeyer and John Doherty and Jeff and uh, a number of other staff that have just made it possible to pull off a great conference. <laughs> the um, objective is to draw attention to the unique challenges and uh, character facing North, the North American West and that is west of the 100th meridian. And as you notice today, we talked about Canada and we looked at issues around Mexico. And I feel very proud that it isn't something just central to the US, but it is central to North American West. And the, the center taps into the realms of art and culture and economy and energy, environment, history, and uh, topics that matter to all of us. It, provides interdisciplinary approaches, and we saw that today, and it allows for discussion and disagreement and, and uh, controversy, and I hope it always holds those values high. Um, although Hope couldn't be here, the Eccles family has been instrumental in, in underwriting this particular conference, and we did get a glimpse of her on the video that Phil showed earlier, um, and she is just a lovely, gracious woman who cares deeply about issues, and she comes at them differently than many others. So she brings, she brings a great sense of place and passion for topics that we all are concerned in about the West. Um, it's also a pleasure. We have a, a special guest tonight who will tell you what she was doing today so she couldn't sit and listen to us discuss wildfire, but she was um, she will give her own personal description, but it's a pleasure to introduce Hillary Franz, who is our Commissioner of Public Lands. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing. This is a position that is an elected position, and she runs a public agency, the Department of Natural Resources. The D Department of Natural Resources focuses not only on forests, but it focuses on water shorelines and oyster beds and salmon habitat. It's a big, complicated agency that um, has many roots in this, in this region, of course. Prior to being elected, she was the executive director of, a, of an organization called FutureWise, which I think originally was 1,000 Friends of Oregon, and then 1,000 Friends of Washington, uh, which addressed, probably for the last 20 years, uh, the organization has addressed transport, sustainable transportation and land use policies. And she was, um, prior to her election, she was the executive director. She led it when Washington, the state of Washington, was in huge growth. And uh, she navigated collaboration with local governments and private stakeholders and environmental groups. And that's the very subject we were talking about today. So you're already up to speed. <laughs> and, Hillary served also on, a, on the city council of a, of a wonderful island, Bainbridge Island. We share a common link that it was a summer home for me and it is the place that she has raised her family. She graduated from Smith College and her law degree is from Northeastern University Law School. Um, Jerry and I have gotten to know Hillary through her campaign um, and are just thrilled that she is leading an old school institution into some new ways. And I think it's a real challenge. And I'm hearing on the ground because of local engagement with a community forest that is owned by the Department of Natural Resources is that she's getting a lot of credential 
by her staff. And I think that's a real tribute to somebody coming in from uh, a unique background that didn't come up through the roots of forestry and managing forests and um, working with firefighting. So you, you're, the word on the ground is good work. Um, the only other uh, thing I would say is that she has the opportunity to bring inspiration to um, a lot of people, not only because of being new at the Department of Natural Resources, but she brings a sense of humor and energy and uh, a fresh way of looking at things. And, and I think you'll see that tonight when she speaks. So she's setting a new standard, and I'm very excited to, that we get to see her in action on a regular basis. She is the mother of three sons, and we also share that. So I, I understand um, it's, a busy, it's a busy life with three sons. And uh, it's just a personal pleasure and for the Lane Center, a pleasure to introduce you, Hillary. Thanks. All right, well, first of all, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, they told me to tell you what I did today. I will tell you right now, my staff all, in a way, my staff, 20% are women, 1,500 organization. I gotta just say, it is so nice to see women in the audience because I never get to see any of you. And I went to all women's high school, all women's college, so for me, it's like, a new era of like a very male dominated field that I'm in but a lot of my staff tends to look after me like we gotta take care of her. we gotta keep her alive and so today I spent from 6 30 a.m. until roughly around 3 p.m. literally fighting fire so I had I have been on a 65 foot ladder to the top of a structure with the full mass gear and oxygen tank uh, I have put out a car fire. I never get to say this. This is the best speech I'm ever going to give. I put out a car fire. I put out a garbage container fire. I put out a two bedroom house fire, two floors. I'm like, I've got my mojo on. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, I extracted a body out of the front seat of the car, climbing through the back window, right? <laughs> right? I know, right? So, um, most of my team is like, oh no, you're gonna be too tired to do a keynote. And I'm like, no, 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 I won't be tired. I'll finally talk in a slower manner because <laughs> most people know I have a lot of energy. Um, and I just, it was an honor to actually come speak to you for two reasons. One, I was just saying, so I have a fond affinity for Stanford University. I unfortunately didn't go there. Maybe that'll be my next life. But my son, um, who's now at Tufts University as a sophomore, went to Stanford University Online High School. At nine years old, he started high school at Stanford University, a phenomenal program. If anyone, you guys should be promoting this. It is leadership and education, starting with the young and saying, and it actually addresses this rural issue. He was on Bainbridge Island. He didn't want to have to commute at 5.30 in the morning to a private school across the water. He wanted to be raised on the farm, experience the farm on Bainbridge and wanted to be educated on the farm. And so Stanford University, he's a phenomenal kid, brilliant kid, enabled him at nine to be studying Sophocles and Anand's Confession and doing everything you, I, any mother of a smart, brilliant child would dream of. And it, it's because of Stanford. And that enables education in every single corner of this country, every single corner of this um, world for kids who don't have that opportunity. Um, and so, and to do it at any other age level. So I will always be a promoter of Stanford University because they're cutting edge at the university level and they're cutting edge at the um, K through 12 level. So with that, I'm also super excited because I have a fond affinity for rural, uh, the rural state, a rural state of Washington, the rural America. Uh, many people get surprised by that. They think I'm a city girl. It doesn't help that I wear heels, um, but I, I have a fond because I'm a third generation rancher, third generation small forest landowner. Um, part of the reason I am good at what I do in the sense of being able to listen and deal with complicated division, which we know sits in the world of lands, whether it's forest or agriculture, whether it's the urban rural divide, is that I was raised by my grandfather and my father. My grandfather was your most conservative Republican, do not tax me, do not regulate me, rancher. And on the other side, I had my father who went to Reed College, right there, tells you something. 
okay, who raised me like you can't get more liberal, social, progressive. I'd say he was a socialist. You know, I already knew at four where my food came from, what kind of pesticides are in most people's food, but not in my food, right? So if you can imagine dinner with both of those and you love them both and they fought voraciously, I'm like, I can handle any, any challenge. Now, I can't, but I can at least listen and be able to find compassion and empathy and the common ground that most people aren't able to see. So I was super excited to be able to talk here and also to learn more about the Bill Lane Center for the American West for elevating the work that you do because I think this is an area, if anything, the 2016 election taught us this is an area of rural America, rural Washington, rural every state that frankly the voices have been forgotten, the voices are not heard and we're going to have to immediately start to really listen and solve these problems because it's only get more challenging with ever increasing population and climate change. Um, in Washington, I am a resident of Seattle, um, having moved from Bainbridge, but in my neck of the woods, uh, it can't be more stark, the urban-rural divide. Um, the discrepancy between the two is sadly not the subject of much debate or conversation. The reality is most people on the east side of the state, which I get to know even more through my role as I cover every corner of the state, frankly doesn't trust anybody on the west side of the state. And people on the west side of the state don't trust anybody on the east side of the state. And really much of that lack of trust isn't about understanding and relationship building. It's just about a clear black and white, we know who they are, they know who we are. And unfortunately right now, Seattle Metro uh, is growing at an unbelievably astonishing pace. We, for the second year in a row, Seattle has the most cranes of any city in the country. Um, just this week, it was reported that Amazon is now the second most valuable company in the world. Seattle has real and significant challenges, homelessness, uh, ho affordable housing, but the reality is it has a safety net an unbelievable safety net that frankly is available to it. Like many of our urban cities, they used to have the blight, they used to have the poverty, they still do, but a safety net is now created there that does not exist at all in our rural communities. And unfortunately, when we look to Seattle and when the east of our state or the rural parts of our state look to Seattle, they believe that there's opportunity and prosperity, but that is not happening in their community and they're right. Our rural areas are experiencing a much different trajectory. As the Commissioner of Public Lands, I travel across the state from the most western part of the state of our coastal communities, which were technically you know, known as the timber towns, um, to the most eastern parts of our state in Ferry County and Ponderay up in the north and down here in the south. In every corner of the state, it is very clear we face the significant challenges of rural poverty and a complete sense of lack of opportunity. Um, it's a different kind of poverty than the rural poverty that my grandparents' generation was able to get out of. He left South Dakota in the midst of the black blizzards of the Great Depression. Family farm went under and he packed his son up and drove west and landed in the beautiful town of Tacoma, which was farming at that point in time, um, and knew that there was opportunity. It's a very different kind of rural, rural poverty that we know now. We see it uh, throughout our state that it can affect anyone when industries disappear and the community is not able to keep up with the rapidly changing economy. An economy that's been changing for decades, more automation, more global competition, and more technology. An economy that in many ways hit rural communities particularly hard because they were not situated or suited for it. Too many workers we know are still reeling from the plants or operations that have moved overseas. We see them front and center in every part of our state, in almost every one of our rural counties. Too many communities are struggling to compete. They're hammered with um, less infrastructure, less investment in that infrastructure. And unfortunately, oftentimes, they're making really poor decisions in the context of land use, right? They're looking for the quickest turn of the dollar, and oftentimes that means housing and subdivisions, which we all know from the recession, is not something that any economy can be stabilized on. Um, in addition to that, we also know that it leads to ever-increasing costs for that community. And the fact is, as the rise of global competition, automation of more and more jobs, and the rise of technology, all these train trends have left many workers behind, and they will continue to do so. And as they do that, we also know that we are having it significantly impact our political situation. 
not only at the state level, but at the national level. For anybody who knows, um, we had communities here, counties that had never actually voted Republican since, had not voted Republican for a governor or president since Hoover that turned in this last election. And if anybody wasn't paying attention before to the people in our rural communities because of just the basic system of compassion, empathy, care, if all they can see is from a political lens, then everybody needs to be paying attention. Um, and that's why I'm really glad your organization exists, because we need to. I think all these trends make it easy for people to feel that somehow the system is rigged, that the American dream is increasingly harder to reach, that the rural voices have been ignored and undervalued and misunderstood. And I didn't know it more until I was in this position. Um, as the Commissioner of Public Lands, I supervise a profound amount of resources, land, staff, and agency expertise. So I oversee 2.6 million acres of aquatic lands. If you think the coast to the entire coastal shoreline, the Puget Sound, every river, stream, and lake in Washington State, I oversee the land, the aquatic bedlands. In our, so think your ports. Thinking, fortunately, unfortunately, I got known for Atlantic salmon nut farms, depends this year. Uh, those were mine. But on the top of that, we generate about 30 million from our shellfish oyster beds alone in Washington State. Um, we also uh, manage two million acres of forest land that, uh, and a million acres of agricultural land and then a significant portfolio of commercial and industrial land that generates $325 million for our state alone. Um, and about $125 million of that goes to our schools. And many of our schools are ones that are significantly challenged and don't have the capacity or ability like in Seattle and other communities to raise their levies. And therefore, they struggle for every single dime they can get. We also fund the other portion of that $350 million for our counties um, in Washington State. And to give you a sense of the value of the dollar we generate over the management of our lands, King County, we are 0.08% of their budget. King County is where Seattle is. It's the largest county population-wise and economic-wise in the state of Washington. In many of our coastal communities that were hit by the Spotted Owl and other challenges like that, we used to represent 80% of their operating budget alone. We're around 40%, and there was no backfill of the other 40%. And I can say the same thing out into many of our communities where much of our agricultural lands is largely for grazing and generates pennies on the dollar for an acre. So recognizing our role, not only in how we manage these lands and need to steward these lands for long-term value economically, but also environmentally and sustainably, not only for this generation, but given climate change, given population growth for a long-term trajectory, and given that much of the revenue that we generate goes to our counties and schools, the basic safety net that we talked about, how we're going to be able to care for the people here today and the children of tomorrow that are going to lead this state and this country. So last, last year I launched uh, a new initiative at Department of Natural Resources that really took a, frankly, a new approach to rural communities and rural economic development. And it's the Rural Communities Partnership Initiative. The idea is simple. We want and know that we already generate huge amount of value for our counties and our states and our economies through the management of our natural resources lands. But we believe if we have more intentionality in that, if we actually think and work more closely with our local governments, our chamber of commerce, our ports districts, we can actually stimulate and grow that economy, but do it in a way that is environmentally sustainable and has a long-term benefit, not a short-term kick. And so our whole context here is to be able to grow our family wage jobs and invest in our state. And what we did is we didn't believe we had the answer for every community. We knew that the community knows most what their challenges are and what their opportunities are. That oftentimes they don't have the connection point to other resources and capacity, um, whether it's the experts that we have because we have economists or land managers or leasing agents, or whether it's avenues to state and federal money that can help be an incubator and give a charge to it. So we put out on our website and invited everyone in the state to please submit any proposals. In less than six months, we got 80 proposals from around the entire state in the smallest of communities in every single corner of the state. And some of these are what's most exciting because we all could have sat in a room and done all this, 
and we think this is a great idea, but if it doesn't come from the community and they haven't created that partnership already, then they're not going to have the ownership and the commitment to see it through. And as we know, you can inject money really quickly in something, but if you don't have actually the incubator of all the entities together to make it possible, it won't work. So here's just some of the exciting partnerships. And literally, I just want to say, six months ago, we la launched this. And we already secured $3.5 million just from our state just in the last two weeks to help move these projects. One is a learning laboratory at Kalama High School. So Kalama High School is in one of the areas is um, around the I-5 corridor. They have been part of, you know, Kalama has been part of the whole context about coal export, which has been a real challenge in our state as they're trying to expand the economy in that Longview area. But unfortunately, in our minds, they were looking at a wrong use of it that is not going to have a long-term value economically or environmentally. And so they also have a large forestry uh, timber component of their economy, but many of the kids that are graduating from high school that didn't plan on to going to a four-year degree, really were looking at technical schools, had no connection to forestry. And they have over 35 acres behind their property that nobody was managing. And it's actual timber land that could be sustainably uh, managed and actually generate value, and they could actually learn on the ground in active learning. And so it's a 25 students a year, we've created a new program at that high school where they will co-manage a 32-acre forest right behind the high school. We will train them how to develop and manage it sustainably, get out the invasive weeds, be able to ensure that the trees are growing healthy and sustainably, set out timber plans, be able to replant and revegetate and reforest, and then have it be a generational cycle that continually is making that, uh, becomes their forest and where they can actually create the next generation of forest management professionals. And I'll just say there was one woman in the whole group and I love that woman because there are very few women in the forest and she was like I was like you rock woman she's like oh yeah I got these guys under control we are gonna get this forest in shape um, second was an unbelievable I love this this is what I love when communities come forward and I say this because a lot of people see no hope in the rural communities and the reality is there is huge amount of hope you all know this because you've gone out there but much of the people don't see that they watch Fox News or they hear horror stories opioid crisis and everything but really there's a lot of great things that are coming out of it but they don't have the ability necessarily to create that nexus to other larger um, people to make the voice clear so the port of Iwaka which is on the coast as well has um, we have derelict vessels. We have vessels that are drowning in the waters. And what's happening is it's creating an environmental and economic mess, right? So it sinks to the bottom. You've got all the contaminants and pollutants in that boat. Grace Harbor alone, which is one of our poorest counties in the state of Washington, spent 1.6 million of their budget just last year alone to remove derelict vessels that were sinking in the, in the water on the coast, right? And it wasn't something they budget because you never know. And our state spends an enormous amount, millions of dollars the same. Um, and what the Port of Iwaka said is, look, we believe that we can remove those vessels easier right here on our shoreline. And if we can create a facility that will take those boats apart, we can actually create a new economy of the, the different types of material on that boat and put it on web. And so we're creating a new facility there. Got them a million dollars to set this facility up with all the protections and environmental protections. And we are going to create a new economy out of the waste economy that's going to clean up the environment and generate over 50 jobs. Take that back, 20 jobs. Next one's 50 jobs. We had a hardwood mill on the coast, significantly challenged. Um, we are now creating 50, uh, 50 family wage jobs by opening up that mill and granting a pipeline of hardwoods. We need to remove much of that hardwoods in a lot of our areas that has taken up the space that, frankly, our native fur need to be in. So we see this as a huge opportunity for a pipeline for sustainably for harvested timber. Another great opportunity, and then I'll, I'll jump to the chase, rural broadband. So up in the northeast corner, there's no rural broadband, as you probably are very familiar of the challenges in our communities. And, um, the reality is we have the same problem in wildfires. So we're the largest on-call wildfire fighting team in the state. Hence, I was fighting wildfires or learning how to today. Um, we can't even have our fire teams communicate with each other or communicate with local fire districts up there. So we have a huge communication gap. And if you think about the fires that we've had and how significant they are, if we can't even communicate, we've got a problem. So we're now connecting Washington State University and the high school and the library system that needs broadband and the Chamber of Commerce and us to start to create a new high-speed internet system for the communities that starts with serving our firefighting team. 
Um, so we are also, I'll say, investing in clean energy. We just finished our 21st wind deal that moves leasing on our agricultural lands from that aren't strong agricultural lands. They tend to be more grazing land and they generate less than a dollar an acre for our schools and counties to $1,200 to $1,400 an acre when we put wind energy on it. And that doesn't even talk about the economic opportunities that come from the jobs and the maintenance of those facilities. We are now in conversation with over nine solar companies because we have no solar on any of our lands at all. And I will say to you, because I spend much of my time in the rural side of our state that is very Republican, they are all in on clean energy. When we're showing the value at the local level and the state level for being able to generate the renewable energy that gives more value to the schools and the counties and is able to actually give more energy resilience. So this is a huge Move. It's going to take a lot of work, but our belief is if we're on the ground, since we're already in those communities, if we can partner with them and show that as a land manager, um, that we together can help grow and stimulate their economy, we'll be more effective. It's made, I think I was seen as an environmentalist whack job when I came in this job. <laughs> um, the first thing I did, which is the best thing you can ever do, is I actually just showed up. I actually showed up in their community and asked to listen and understand what their greatest challenges are, what their greatest opportunities, what they were most worried about for their kids. And that alone is the most significant thing you can do. And then after you do that, say, hey, I really love to work together. Tell me how we can do that. And then let them come forward because they have unbelievable ideas. And I think, unfortunately, for too long, there's been too much judgment that has clouded most of the perceptions of our rural West. I'll move to the next and my final piece, which is forest health and wildfire. So we have a significant forest health crisis in our state, and I know wildfire was a big part of your topic this time, and it certainly is something that I spend much of my year stressing over as the largest on-call wildfire fighting team in the state. Um, we have a significant forest health crisis, and we have a wildfire crisis. 2.7 million acres of our forests in Washington State are diseased and dying. Um, much, uh, half of that is on federal land that has not had any of the act, uh, treatments to be able to remove the dead, dying, diseased, drought trees. The other half is on state, tribal, and some private land. We are already seeing, and I fear every single moment, we were blessed this last year, you know, not to be in as bad a position as Oregon and California. As we know, it was a wake-up call that shows how significant our fires are getting. They're nothing like we saw 20 years ago. And they're, what we see now is nothing like what we're going to see in 20 years from now. And we've got to get on top of this problem. So this last year, I de we developed at our team a 20-year forest health plan for Washington State that has us treating 70,000 acres a year um, through vi me mechanical thinning and selective thinning and prescribed burning. Um, it's a scale of forest treatment that has never been attempted in our state. I don't know about others, but we are very far behind many other states, and much, one which we need to immensely scale up for. Um, right now, we frankly don't even have enough foresters to actually treat 70,000 acres a year. You see an economic job opportunity? I do, right? Um, we also don't have the training in prescribed burning, which is a significant piece that we need because much of that left when people stopped doing it here. So the vast majority of, here's my other challenge, the vast majority of my on-call firefighting team, it's over 600 people, sometimes 800 in a bad season, are not actual full-time firefighters. I only have, as the largest on-call firefighting team in the state, next to the federal government, and the local fire districts, I'm at, even top them, I only have 43 full-time fire, fires to cover this entire state. The rest are my IT managers. They're my human resource gut person. They are, they could be the one that's my geologist, because we're also the Washington State geology, think landslides, volcanoes, earthquakes, right? So they're pulled off their job during fire season. And historically, fire season was pretty small. But now we're seeing fire seasons going six months. So we have a huge problem that we are set up with a model when our fires were very different in the 1800s than they are now. And we don't have the resources. And last year, we got zero in our budget for wildfire suppression. That was after 2014, 2015, 2016 cost us $500 million. We burned over a million acres. And we're still at zero in our state budget. So we got a problem. And so what we're working on is this is an opportunity that when, how can we take the issue of not enough people doing forest health, because I don't have enough trained people, 
and I don't have enough money to do wildfire suppression full-time because it's not a full-time job and how do I actually instead create what I'm calling I'm breaking news ground here right now first time I'm announcing the forest health new deal right we all remember the new deal right we all remember at that moment in time where we knew by investing in infrastructure we created jobs we strengthened the economy gave greater opportunity so the idea we're working on is how do we train and experience firefighters and during the off season we train them also to become experienced foresters. And the core right now is funded by the revenue generated from forest health treatments, which given the federal lands and the breadth of land that needs to be treated, and we now have, um, we have authority to now treat federal lands in addition to our own state lands through Yes Forest Service and BLM. Um, we see an, the federal government will pay us for those treatments. That will generate not only opportunity for actually doing further forest treatments that we train people to do that creates jobs, and at the same time, it will also be able to generate more economic opportunity in the communities and at the same time fund our counties and schools. We see this as a huge opportunity for win, win, win. And when we think about how much we're wasting in money on wildfire, $500 million in 2014, 2015, 2016. Last year alone was our best fire season with 96% of our fires below 10 acres and we spent $130 million as a state. If we can start to get on top of the forest health issue and make it an opportunity for people to get trained with those skills and at the other half of the year be able to fight fires, we'll keep the fires smaller, we'll be able to treat the forest, and we'll reduce our impacts across the board economically, environmentally, and social health. So one of the, I'll just leave you with this and then I'll go to questions and answers. Um, you know, President Eisenhower, it's one of, become one of my favorite quotes, once said, whatever America hopes to bring to pass in the world must first come to pass in the heart of America. And when I think about the heart of America, I think about my grandfather and I think about the land that he worked um, from the time he was a small boy. Um, and so many ways from the resilience in the face of challenges like wildfires, drought, and a very changing economy that's not keeping up with our rural communities to the fact that our rural communities are truly gonna be the place we absolutely are gonna depend on from growing the food we eat and the wood that house us and caring for the lands and the clean water that we all depend on. Rural America truly presents that beating heart. It's our beating heart. And that's why these communities are so important. It's because when America's rural communities are healthy and strong, it's true that Washington State is healthy and strong. It's true that America is healthy and strong. It's true that the context of alienating or judging can be removed and we can move to common values. It's true that we can start to make decisions that aren't about one part of the state versus another part of the state, but start to make decisions that is about our state as a whole and frankly the children that are going to inherit the state from us and everything I say about our state is directly applied to obviously our nation. Um, the one thing I know, and I started with the context of common values, my grandfather and my father and the common values that they always knew that bound them and it bound me and it's what I was grown in, raised in with is a faith that hard work and responsibility and persistence and a belief in caring for everyone will lead to a greater place not only for ourselves but for our children. And I truly think that we have lost that compass and the best way we start is to actually go out and meet our neighbor, not the one right next door to us, but the one across from our state from us, the one in the most foreign corners of our state or our country, and just ask to have coffee with them and get to know them and listen. And when you do, you're gonna make some of the best friends. And I tell this to the most urban crowds because many just have created a block of judgment. Um, we've got to start to assume the best in each other, not the worst. We got to remember that all of us have fallen on hard times at different points and every one of us, our job is to pick every other person up and give them an opportunity to succeed and not fail. And in doing so, I think rural Washington, rural America, rural California, rural Oregon, rural Midwest is going to become the shining star that we all need and depend on because they feed and provide for us. So thank you. I was, I'm my most tired I've ever been. And only Peter knows this because I'm usually like a machine gun when I talk. 
or a sprinkler. I like that better. Sorry, I like that better. Okay, take that back. Take it back. Anyways, I can do questions, comments. Yes, sir. On the second question, I'll have you kill the tape. No, I'm joking. Just kidding. Oh, my gosh. Wow. No, if, if Peter knows me well. Most people know I, what you see is what you get. So, I'll be. so I... Um, so with Sally, I mean, thoroughly impressed, I have to be honest, what I most impressed by was her plan and the strategic plan. I have not gone through and evaluated the full measurement of the implementation of that and have not looked in thorough diligence of that. Um, I also, uh, so I wouldn't be able to say that. I think she's an amazing woman who stood for the right values and really did try to reach across the aisle and reach into the communities, um, knowing that her landscape was pretty significant. And I was impressed by the context of valuing recreation and also valuing clean energy opportunities within that context and trying to move people to a new approach. On the marijuana, this is, you know, it's interesting. So it, it, this is coming from somebody who literally did not see pot for the first time until two years ago and not so I could smoke it. I'll make that clear, but because somebody in my office said, how could you be as old as you are and never seen marijuana, okay? <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, the truth is I wanted to be a politician at nine, and so I made a clear thing. I was never going to break a law, do a drug, right? And so, obviously, it was before Clinton and during Clinton that I was saying all this because it's a whole new world. But with that being said, um, I don't come with a propensity for marijuana, uh, and um, it's obviously something that's now growing in our state. And people are raising this question about, okay, what about growing uh, marijuana. We actually have a divide in our agency. Um, I would say to you right now, for me, I think we could be doing far more and growing far more better value crops personally to feed our people with it, with, that we need to um, than doing and growing marijuana. Hemp may be something that I'd be interested in focusing on. I clearly am bringing value judgments into this. Um, and um, just because of the value of hemp for being able, everything we know, from paper to clothing, right? Um, and we haven't looked at the full return on that. Um, I will say separate from that, which I have not dived in too much, there's a big discussion about actually whether marijuana farming is working here in Washington State. And I don't, I have, I have a much bigger job, so I have not spent any side time reading about it, but a lot of people are raising the question about whether growers can actually succeed here. And since everything we grow here is to feed the next generation, their academic and also their hospitals and libraries, and there's a, for me, I want to make sure we're creating a sustainable crop that actually feeds our people first. Um, so, yeah. And you're losing half of your revenue on marijuana to the gray market from cannabis to organ. That's what I figured, so. I'm not interested, and if you have more information so I can keep those people behind me going, hey, what about this? I'd be happy, because then I can shoot them even farther away, but yeah. Yes? So are you, you kind of zoomed by this topic, uh, <laughs> but what the crowd may not know, but maybe you've heard in passing, is that one of the things that Hillary uh, inherited was this uh, Atlantic salmon farming operation <laughs> off the coast, which had a massive uh, <sighs> Yeah. Yeah, so just so everybody understands, the three million acres of uplands that I manage is um, all of the funding is largely in a beneficiary model. So I manage as a fiduciary obligation to our schools and counties, right? So I've got to show, and then I also have 150,000 acres of recreation land. So we're really, we're the second largest recreation land manager, second to the federal government. So I have a huge recreation, and we obviously are growing and stimulating that economic side. So I don't want to pass by that. In the aquatic lands that we manage, all of that revenue goes to um, ensuring public access for people to the waters and um, fish and habitat restoration. Um, and so it's a very different, a very different sort of focus. Um, still, environmental sustainability goes across all of those for all the reasons we know. But in this context, um, so as we manage 2.6 million acres of land with enormous amount of facilities in those waters, right? So ports, who's been to the Edgewater in Seattle? So we don't actually just lease that facility, we actually own it. So I'm the, 
on behalf of the public of Washington State, the owner of the Edgewater, and we hire somebody to run that hotel. Um, so I give, the, right, so the Seattle waterfront is all the aquatic lands, we manage all that. And so you can imagine we have an enormous amount of infrastructure that is in those waters that creates sometimes negative impacts to the environment and fish and wildlife habitat and sometimes positive. Um, in that, like any tenant, and I inherited an enormous amount of leases as you can imagine, some of these go back to the 80s and the 90s. Um, there is obviously a, a clear statement in there that says you must manage these in and keep them in safe and good working order for the obvious because when you don't in the context of Atlantic salmon which um, you obviously we had hundreds of thousands of Atlantic salmon that were released into the Puget Sound they've been found all the way into Canada all the way south down in down into Olympia and even farther um, an enormous amount of question about the impact that this would have on our Puget Sound, on our Pacific salmon, which are already dying a death by a thousand cuts. Um, there's still a lot of science that is unknown out there, and then there's a lot of science we do know. For me, my number one responsibility is that I truly believe if you are going to lease the lands from a public agency with the responsibility of stewarding those and managing those on behalf of the public, not just today, but in the future, that that is an honor. It's an honor to have that position to lease. And as a result, you need to hold the same values we hold, which is about managing those facilities in good, safe working order that will not threaten the future of our native populations and our fish and wildlife habitat and our waters. And so um, we took action on two facilities that were in clear violation of those leases. Um, I will say that this has raised a full, you know, I'm one year in, <laughs> it's raised a very clear, uh, thing for me about how many other leases on those 2.6 million acres of land going back into those leases and looking at how are those other facilities not just necessarily Atlantic salmon but others maintain their facilities to make sure there isn't harm because obviously we have oil container ships we've got cargo ships going outside of ports and facilities so yeah yes You mean sort of people moving into the, into the, yeah, and so obviously, I mean, the biggest, that's the biggest challenge we face is we have enormous amount of people that are moving into the forest interface, and as a result, we don't have, and most of our local fire districts in the most wildfire prone areas, many of them are actually volunteer fire districts. Right, so they have very limited resources. We finally were able to start to give our equipment away that's older, outdated. And I delivered a truck to the Chisaw community that literally that morning, they stopped a major fire going into Canada the year before. The day I delivered that truck, their last truck and their only truck died, right? So limited resources, and they're called out to go and help fight these fires, and we don't have the resources given the span we have and how limited our dollars are. One of the things we just passed in the legislature this year, I believe, and um, is actually to start being able to be able to help local counties on the mapping and zoning of that so they really understand the impact of enabling development to happen in those forests. And to give you a sense of the $130 million we spent on this last fire season, I don't have the exact count, but I know we spent over $10 million just to protect 12 homes, right? 12 homes. And, you know, and so, and these are not homes, these are not homes that are limited means and resources, right? So that is creating another dichotomy of like, and when do, I was the one that made the call, like, go protect the homes, right? When do, and these are, these are not decisions that are easy to make. And I certainly wouldn't want to be the one that says, no, I'm not going to take steps to protect your home. But we aren't necessarily paying fully for the cost of having the homes in it. We've got to create a new approach to that, too, and address that. Yes? On a much lighter note, in 1972, I investigated the health conditions at Neal Island at the Federal Penitentiary, and I remember the clamps on the other side of the island. Is that under your rubric to monitor the clamp reduction on the Neal Island? I bet it is. Peter probably knows even better. I'm still getting this whole territory. But yes, we, have, we manage an enormous amount of leases of shellfish, and I'm sure that is one of ours. 
Um, and I'll, I'll give you, just to, to thank you, I'll, you know, I'll give you guys something that's interesting most people don't know too. So we actually, um, we hire um, people in prison to actually help fight our fires. We are, I was just out in Spokane just last week for a forest health treatment on state parks that we're doing um, where we hired people in prison to do that work. Um, and actually the wood product that went, we took that and then we we're giving it to the SNAP program so that for low income housing, so they have wood during the winter, right? And so we, and I actually have hired people who came out of prison and now have been trained. They might've been trained to fight fires. They might've been trained in forest health. They might've been trained in dispatch um, that are now working and have the technical skills. So, you know, there's a whole connection here to the work we're doing. First of all, one thing I already know that if you're locked up in a cell all day, there's no way you're getting a healthy body or a healthy mind or a healthy spirit. And the more we can get people out on the land and it has a value and a return that actually helps us reduce fires, helps give them skilled training, we are actually going to create people who can actually give back. And the greatest story I heard when I was out there is this guy said to me, he goes, the greatest thing I did when I fought this fire is I stopped that fire getting to that house and the woman came out and she didn't know who I was. He said, thank you so much for taking care of my home and he goes i will never go back to prison again because you know what i finally felt like i was valued i finally felt like i could make a difference and so that synergy is just the most powerful thing and we are looking at even more opportunities to make um, that possible too yes uh, i have a question i'm not sure if it falls in your preview uh, hanford <laughs> hanford yes yeah, I don't, I should get a clearer answer on this. I love it. I love when I'm in very well-educated audiences. Uh, I should uh, get more information. I don't believe we have much authority over that at all. So, but... Um, Obviously, I think there's always a downward the water and land. There's always a downward component, as we know. So we are probably somehow impacted for sure and could have a voice, too. Yeah, go ahead. Um, question about uh, following up on the Southern Virginia project and the proposal to have Raisin Fire Protection Association in the state. Or is that a specific thing? My good friend is the operator of owner operator. Yeah, so we were working on it. I mean, it was a very short session, two months. You would not want to know how much legislation we were working on, either playing offense or defense, and then obviously fighting for budget opportunities. Um, and so we worked behind the scenes a lot on trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. It, it was a short session, and I think it needed more time up front to be worked on. And so we'll be working on it. Representative Dunn is leading that. He's a dear friend. Um, and, you know, I think we need to probably work there some people have some issues I think it's worked in some states we need to look at those models and figure out what will work best here um, I'm a big believer when I came in this agency there was a lot of a lot of concern and question about letting home landowners be able to manage and treat their own land right from fire and a lot of it was trying to figure out how much was truth and right and how much was lore right you know a lot happens on the fire right um, and I think I'm a big believer in always being able to task and empower someone to take care of their own community and their own landscape but we want to make sure they have the resources and the training to do that and they're also that we're coordinating our efforts as well as possible so that um, everybody stays safe Thank you. We're very pleased with your, the DNR local um, supervisor, but that was because you broke a lot of half the water meeting, so he knows everybody. Yeah, yeah. And his local knowledge makes it possible for us to coordinate on an informal basis that, um, that is really a good model for how the association is going. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that, I, so the agency had become, my sense of it based on what I'd heard is very much turned inward and taken a risk averse approach, you know, and I think government 
is always faced with enormous amount of challenges, limited resources, and a lot of competing demands and pressures, that the more we can be outward facing and actually being in the community and listening to community and taking criticism in as much as com compliments, the more we will be effective. Um, and all the way to the 20-year wildfire plan that we've cre we're creating right now, um, we'll be launching, it'll be finished in June, is the first one our agency's ever done. And this was something that I really wanted to do, which is about, we don't believe as a state agency alone, we're setting, can be most effective at fighting the fires we're seeing now and we'll be able to see, we will be seeing um, alone. And historically, we've always done strategic plans ourselves, right? We just said, our agency, what does it need to do set up for the next five years of fires, next 10 years? So instead, I've called that we're bringing U.S., uh, so U.S. Forest Service, BLM, National Guard, our state MOBs um, and DNR and our local fire districts to create one plan for the entire state to be equipped to be able to fight these fires. It's my sense of it, what I've heard from most of the people is thank you for inviting us in because everybody has a different lens and a different perspective and a different need and a different understanding and different opportunity to give. So stay tuned in June. And Molly was part of that too, so yeah. And there's a question. Oh, okay, yeah, and then I'll go to you in the back. Go ahead. Don't remind me. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I don't have a boss. Let me just start there. I don't have a boss, but the public. That's my boss. Well, that's what I'm saying. So I don't have a boss. So if I was appointed, I'd report to the governor. So I report directly to the people, right? And um, so for me, if anybody doesn't know, I'm very much a people person, right? And so I actually have the ability that I, and, and a sense that it's my duty, it's my obligation, even separate from my agency, but as an elected official, to go out into the community and meet with everyone. I don't just meet with Democrats, even though I'm a Democrat. Like, and if I ran a six month campaign, it was pretty insane. Um, most often you have a year and a half to run a statewide campaign and I was not well known. Um, in six months, and a majority of my votes did come from more populated urban centers, which for me, that was more based on time, not based on who I am. And my goal right now is to show that I don't serve one party and I don't serve one population center, I serve the entire state. In fact, in my role as Commissioner of Public Lands, because so much of the communities that are in the rural side of the state with very low population base and tend to be more Republican conservative, it's even more on me to go actually meet and work with them because the work that we do delivers more to them, right, than it does necessarily to our most urban population centers. I, I forget sometimes I'm elected though, to be honest. <laughs> it may come up in a few years. Yeah, and, I think it's like, <laughs> I mean, actually, when I when I ask him for a check, it will come up really quickly. No. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, <laughs> So we just got several bills passed in the legislature to address that, including PTSD as well. And um, we obviously stand behind those and work with the Washington State Firefighters Council who really works on that. But I'll just say personally, as now leading this agency, I, I will tell you almost every month or every other month, someone in my agency is being diagnosed with cancer. Okay. so. Um, I have not been front and center in this. I did grow up in a fire station because my dad worked for the City of Portland Fire Department for many, many years. Um, but obviously when you're a small girl, you're not necessarily aware and attuned to the realities of what life is like. Um, and I now see it firsthand. And I have some uh, people who become very, very dear to me and very, very close. I see people who are very, very young to f in their mid-50s. Um, and then also, I've, creating close friendships with fire district chiefs and, and firefighters 
Um, in fact, today I spent much of the day with firefighting crew, and I just look at them, and my heart is worried. What's the next five years hold for them? What's the next 10 years? Um, and we need to do more. Um, and I will stand behind making sure we do more. Yeah. There was a question, I think, over here. No? You guys good? Okay. Huh? Wait, did you have a question really quick? Yeah, you can. It's okay. It may be too big of a question. There's no question too big. I'm joking. He asked me about marijuana, for goodness sakes. That's the toughest question I could ever get. <laughs> Uh, it's related. Yeah, but it is exactly. It, it is related. So it's, it's a, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One, the Supreme Court rules in the state of Washington do not apply to take the culverts uh, salmon passage. What would you suggest the department do? And if it and if the Supreme Court rules, yes, we're going to uphold the lower court and we are going to require yeah. a million dollars worth of repairs to the culverts. So this may be the easiest question I got tonight. So let me just say firsthand um, that I, um, I actually, so I've worked on salmon issues for over 20 years as an environmental land use attorney before I was in this role. And um, so protection of our native salmon species is one of the, for me it's heart and soul, right? Um, watching my kids be able to actually watch salmon come in to spawn and go out and the concern that, well, their children my grandchildren ever be able to see that because we know runs have gone and to me that's a loss that's on a human level as well as we know on a species level um, so I took a clear position actually on culverts and I urged uh, the Attorney General to please not uh, appeal the case um, you can find my letter I'm not real broadcast about it but you can it was actually the tribes um, their brief actually included my letter in it um, I'll say firsthand, we actually are directly impacted. We had a number of culverts we had to actually replace as part of that litigation. We are, have one culvert remaining. We fixed all of them but that one, and I do understand Department of Transportation has a much larger issue and much more costly component, but we did take on that responsibility, and we're in the process of fixing that last one. It's a little bit complicated because, it, let's just say it's complicated, but we're going to get to it. We're going to fix it. Um, in addition to that, um, I also uh, feel profoundly um, pained, actually, about the appeal because what the Ninth Circuit ruled was significant. And um, I have grave concerns about losing, not just on the context of culverts, but what it means to actually ensure the long-term sustainability and health of salmon in Washington State, and not just in Washington State, as we know, um, but also the cultural treaty rights of our tribal communities, right? Um, and uh, any overturn of that, I think, is much larger even than just culverts. Um, and that has grave concerns for me. In addition to that, I truly believe this is solvable. It frankly is solvable. And I'll just say personally, in 2015, we took on Washington State, the largest transportation package in our state's history, $32 billion, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we had an opportunity, we obviously use it by leveraging and, and increasing the gas tax. Um, in that context, if we had actually increased the gas, gas tax by, I'm not even going to do the math right now, but half a cent, a cent, right, we could have made a huge, huge dent on the issue of culverts in our state being able to meet that obligation under that case. We missed that window. It's not too late. And frankly, if we're going to show leadership in the state, not only for the context as a statewide elected who has culverts, and, but also for the people and future generations and our tribal communities, then what we would do right now is not even wait for a case, the determination of the court. And we would go immediately and start to move legislation that has an increase of some created some kind of mechanism. Obviously, we've tackled McCleary and funding our schools. We know there's a lot, but I believe this is solvable, and I believe it's our responsibility to do that. Yes. Uh, totally off the, that previous question. Um, the state of Washington has an electric vehicle uh, credit that I understand has now expired. Is, is there motivation to <laughs> That may be one topic I don't know. I do have an electric vehicle. 
Uh, gosh, um, I don't know that, but I probably could find it out for you. Yeah, I could probably find it out. Amongst my day job, it doesn't leave me enough time to figure out, you know, the latest technology in electric vehicles and also where we are at on it. So, yeah, yeah. I know I saw it coming in town. Thank you very much. I know. Um, yeah. So, yes, you want another one? Look at that. Oh, I'll look at that. I love this. And I would say to you, one of the things on the carbon legislation, right, initiative, we, one of the things we really focus on and I urge is that focus on our rural economies and our natural resource lands that are most impacted and making sure any carbon legislation or um, initiative passes really recognizes that, that it's not just going to electrical vehicles because it's not going to necessarily help in the larger scheme. Um, and also the challenges we need about making our communities more resilient, which lies right in our rural communities especially. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that yeah. was really great. And uh, this actually concludes our program. So once again, uh, we're really pleased that we had the turnout that we did. And uh, everybody for a very long day, but everyone's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you.